everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a huge pleasure for me to, um, to host Global Immunotalks today. My name is Laura McKay. I'm from the Doherty Institute at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And today um, it's on behalf of all of the 2022 Global Immunotalks organizers. Um, I'm hosting our Global Immuno speaker, Dr. Joseph Sun um, from Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. Um, before um, I introduce Joe, I'd just like to remind everybody um, within our format at Global Immuno Talks, we'll be taking questions over Twitter at the end of the talk. Um, and I'll give instructions on how to how that Q&A works uh, with a slide at the end of the talk. And just to remind you to tune in next week where we'll have Kazuo Moro from Japan. She'll be talking about group uh, two ILCs. So um, Joe, welcome. It's an absolute pleasure um, to have you here. Um, Joe is a professor at Memorial Sloan Kettering um, in New York. Let me just tell everybody just a little bit about Joe. Um, Joe did his PhD um, with Mike Bevan at uh, the University of Washington in Seattle and studying, um, not surprisingly, with Mike Bevan's CD8 T cell memory. And then um, Joe made um, the leap from T cell memory to NK cell memory being accredited really with the discovery of NK cell memory, NK, uh, cell memory in Louis, Louis Lanier's lab um, at UCSF. And then um, Joe started his own lab. He was recu recruited to um, Sloan Kettering um, where he's been um, ever since. Joe's now full professor there and program director of the immunology and micro microbial pathogenesis um, program. Um, Joe has published um, some really seminal papers in the field of NK cell biology, including um, their development, of course, um, convincing anyone who works on T cells and B cells, it's not just these cells that have memory, um, which is what some of what Joe will be talking today. Um, testament to Joe's um, great mentorship, Joe will also be joined with some by trainees, which he'll introduce um, later in his talk. But um, Joe's been decorated with several awards, including the Burroughs Welcome Trust um, and American Cancer Society. He's a research scholar. And Joe, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, as you know, in Global Immunotalks, we would love to start by asking you a question so everyone can get to know you just a little bit better. And so the question that we have for you is, could you share with us one of the most impactful decisions and um, that affected your career. Well, hello, Laura, and thanks for this opportunity to, to present our work. Um, <clears throat> thanks to you and the committee. Re regarding that question, I think one of the most impactful things I, you know, regarding my career, I, I, I always wanted to put mentorship at, at the forefront of, of, you know, what we do as PIs. You know, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to train with um, Mike Bevan and Louis Lanier, who are both fantastic mentors, and, and they were extremely supportive of me when I was starting out my own lab. And um, that's one of the, the goals that, that I have for my trainees as well, whether they be at the graduate school level, but especially at the postdoc level to really promote their careers um, and to really help them to to launch out in a in a strong way and i think you know so for some scientists their legacy is um you know their discoveries alone but i think if we can make a really impactful you know if we can impact our trainees and that becomes our legacy i think that that's almost you know just as powerful or more powerful <clears throat> Joe, I love that sentiment. I couldn't agree with you more. And um, when I was fortunate enough to visit your lab, um, I can attest to all of your um, trainees were so, so happy and we're so looking forward to hearing a little bit more from them um, later today. So Joe, we're so excited for your talk. Um, if you could share your slides, um, we're looking forward to hearing from you. All right. All right, I'm gonna get started. Um, That's great. The title of my talk today is um, uh, The Innate and Adaptive Responses of NK Cells. For those in immunology that haven't been following um, NK cell biology as closely, 
um, I want to highlight some of these these newer features of, of this cell type that was first described by Eva Klein back in 1975 um, as natural killers. Coincidentally, that was the year I was born. And um, <clears throat> it's kind of cool that Eva described this lymphocyte that can mediate natural killing or the ability to, to um, target cells for um, uh, um, cytolytically and um, allow for, um, for host protection against um, things like viruses or, or tumors. And um, since Eva's discovery um, over the decades, we've, we've found many molecular features of these cells as well as um, some of the newer features, in, including these ability to mediate adaptive type of responses. Um, so just to begin, I, I like to show this slide because I created this slide actually as a first year graduate student over 20 years ago. So if there are grad students in the audience, um, I encourage you to hang on to your slides because you never know how far they will take you. Um, I think most of the immunologists in this audience will immediately recognize what is depicted in this graph. Um, and that's the differentiation of T cells from a naive state um, where they undergo clonal expansion to form a pool of effectors which can then contract and form memory and, and then can be recalled when there's a second um, infection. And I think these are many of the traits we attribute to adaptive immunity. Now, if we were to overlay what the innate immune system might look like on this slide, it, it might look something like this, where the magnitude of a, of a primary response and a secondary response don't differ. They, um, respond very quickly and then go away and then upon a secondary encounter with the same pathogen um, you get a very similar response. Um, so there is no memory and there's no recall. And what we in the textbooks lump under innate immunity is basically anything that's not a T or B cell. So NK cells are found under this umbrella along with um, dendritic cells, myeloid cells, granulocytes, et cetera. Um, but in recent years, we've, uh, we and, and many other groups have discovered that there are subsets of NK cells that can behave in, a, in an adaptive manner where there is antigen specificity. So there's a subset of NK cells in, in mouse and a comparable subset in human that can recognize uh, herpes virus infections, um, including uh, viruses like cytomegalovirus. So in, in mouse cytomegalovirus infection, there's an antigen that's specifically recognized through a receptor on NK cells um, that can lead to um, a type of clonal proliferation in uh, this cell, in this subset, which can then uh, undergo a contraction phase to form long-lived memory cells that can then be recalled. And this was um, uh, a finding we made um, over a decade ago now. Um, just as a bit of background, um, NK cells we know are important in protecting us against viral infection. So this was one of the first cases uh, documented by Christine Byron uh, who, who, who sadly recently passed away, um, but she was one of the leaders in our field. And she first described this patient who had normal T and B cell numbers, but had an NK cell deficiency. And what she came down with was severe viral infections, including those of the herpes virus family. One of the early cases where, um, where we began to to understand that NK cells are protective um, against viral infections. Um, this was a recent um, article in the New York Times. This was from a few years ago during the height of the Zika epidemic. And it was, it was interesting to me because the um, writer of the science writer here keenly noted that CMB actually affects um, far more newborns than, than even Zika did at the time, even though Zika was getting all the press. <clears throat> we also know that CMB is 
is impactful in transplant patients. So in many settings where um, basically the immune system is suppressed um, in, in either cancer patients across the street here at Memorial Sloan Kettering um, or in transplant patients, uh, CMV is a pathogen that can become uh, problematic because it, it pops up when you are immunosuppressed. Um, I mentioned NK cells have both innate and adaptive responses. They are lumped under innate immunity because of their ability to rapidly respond um, to um, injury or, or pathogens or, or other insults. Um, this comes from a recent review that uh, my postdoc Adriana and, and Rebecca um, wrote for annual reviews this past year. And in it, they highlight both the innate and adaptive phases. And, and here in this cartoon, Adriana highlights how um, NK cells very early after infection um, can respond to cytokines in their environment and produce effector cytokines such as interferon gamma. They can also rapidly kill targets um, through lytic granules. Um, and then of course, as I already highlighted NK cells, um, specific subsets can undergo this clonal expansion uh, leading to um, long-lived memory cells. And, and this is part of their adaptive feature. And throughout this talk, we'll be highlighting both the innate and adaptive functions of these cells. <clears throat> um, some of the, the, the ways we characterize memory cells is, are, are by these traits uh, highlighted in this box here. But I encourage you, if you're interested, to have a look at Adriana and Beck's review. Um, so the, the way we first stumbled upon um, this clonal expansion and memory in, in mice, at least, was by a very simple experimental design. And this was borrowed from my days as a T cell biologist where we would transfer TCR transgenic cells and, and watch them take off when you give them a, um, a pathogen. For example, OT1s against Listeria that expresses OVA or P14s that respond to LCMV. And here we're taking wild type NK cells that are congenically distinct <clears throat> we're putting them into um, a recipient mouse and, and hitting them with CMV so that we can follow this response. Here, the recipient is a Li49H deficient mouse, um, but this mouse has a normal NK cell compartment. It just lacks that activating receptor. And that's the one that recognizes CMV as I highlighted in the previous cartoon. So in this setting, the wild type cells are the ones that we can track following CMV infection. And um, one experiment might look something like this, where if you transfer small numbers, you can barely detect them on day zero. But a week later, you can see that um, these cells have expanded um, quite substantially. And in a separate experiment highlighted on the right, you can find these cells um, throughout the different organs in the mice in both lymphoid as well as non-lymphoid organs. So this is the effector response at day seven. And here in this experiment, we waited 50 days later and you can still find these transferred cells. They've now contracted to form a smaller pool of memory cells, but they're still readily detectable in, in uh, the various lymphoid as well as non-lymphoid organs. Now, I mentioned there's a human subset that can respond to human CMV, and this was a study from Lewis Lanier's group that highlights how this NKG2C positive population, um, which is found at very low frequency in, in those individuals that don't have CMV, um, can be rapidly expanded and very robustly expanded in individuals that um, acquire CMV. You can see that this expansion almost mimics what we can model in mice uh, above. And the first longitudinal study that described this clonal expansion and then contraction of this pool probably comes from this Hans Gustav Lundgren study, um, which, which, which was a retrospective um, hantavirus outbreak uh, study where 
they followed um, individuals who came into the clinic presenting of hantavirus um, symptoms. And they noted that there's this population, the NKG2C positive population that expanded, contracted, and, and here you can see out to over a year, it remains elevated. And um, e even though this study is imperfect, um, it highlights the ability of this subset to undergo this expansion. Now they later showed that this isn't due to the Hanta virus because only CMB zero positive individuals mounted such a response. So it's likely that um, this Hanta virus was probably reactivating CMB in these individuals. And this was the, the response to CMB. Um, in more recent studies, um, we found several additional features of adaptive immunity that uh, T cell folks have attributed to, to their favorite um, lymphocyte. Um, and we find similar features such as avidity selection in NK cells. So a student of mine, Nick Adams, published a, a couple of years back that um, there is some heterogeneity in the Li49H NK cell population. And he found this bifurcation of uh, function such that the higher, the NK cells that express higher levels of Li49H um, mediated uh, greater cytotoxicity, expansion, and memory. And the ones that were lower um, for Li49H expression had higher ability to induce cytokines um, such as interferon gamma. And so he, he noted that there is this selection of NK cells that that based on avidity that um, T cell folks have appreciated for decades now. Um, and then um, there's a postdoc in the lab, Simon Grassman, when he was still at the University of Munich, um, who did these um, single NK cell transfers to look at just how robust the NK cell can undergo clonal expansion. And I, I love this experiment because it, it compares the Li49 HNK cell, the ability to undergo clonal expansion to um, one of our favorite T cells, the OT1. And we know that OT1s have a strong affinity for synfecal on class one and, and can mount these robust uh, expansions. And here, what Simon did was transfer a single either NK cell or T cell that was uh, color barcoded. And so you get this range of responses, but you can see on the upper end of the NK cell expansion, this almost comes into um, pretty close proximity to what a T cell can undergo. And you can push a single NK cell to, to clonally expand, give rise to um, uh, over 100,000 progeny, which I, I found uh, close to 100,000 progeny, which, which I found really remarkable. And this is almost on par with what you find with OT1 cells. And I think he primed these with uh, listeria that expresses OVA. <clears throat> um, I want to highlight some recent studies um, done by two really talented postdocs who are in the lab. Um, Colleen Lau, who is going to present uh, a little in a little bit, and then uh, Gabby Weedman. Gabby was, um, has recently started her own lab back in Munich, and Colleen will be um, starting her lab um, this summer. And they were interested in how inflammatory cytokines uh, program the antiviral NK cell response. And so this was built, th this study I'm going to highlight was built on an earlier study that Colleen published a few years back where um, she looked at both the transcriptome and epigenome of NK cells as they transition across this time course. So I've already highlighted previously in cartoon format uh, these different stages. And so she looked at naive NK cells, NK cells early after activation um, as they begin to undergo um, this proliferative response. So we looked at day four and then the peak of the effector response at day seven and then an early contraction phase and a, and a later one. And um, what she initially did was to perform ATAC and RNA-seq um, 
Uh, I'm going to highlight the ATAC seq data here in this slide where she found um, changes, very dynamic chromatin accessibility changes. So uh, peaks that are either gained or lost as you transition between these time points. So from zero to two, two to four, four to seven, et cetera. And you can see very dynamic changes occurring early um, during this uh, response that, um, that diminish a little bit as you transition to the memory phase. And a lot of these differential, differentially accessible regions occur in intergenic and intronic regions, interestingly, more so than promoter regions. And this is highlighted by the, the darker shading here that highlights peaks that are changing um, more or less. <clears throat> and so if you look at all the differentially accessible peaks and, and especially the high fold changes where, where a small peak becomes a really big peak or vice versa, you can see that um, the larger changes are happening in these um, putative enhancer regions, either in intergenic or intronic regions, more so than the promoter region. And when she performs hierarchical clustering, um, she found that there are waves of chromatin accessibility that occur in the NK cell as it undergoes differentiation from a naive to effector to a memory cell. Uh, highlighted are some of the genes that are found in these regions as they undergo these changes. And she finds that some of these changes are, are more permanent or stable, uh, such as cluster one, which starts with an open region, closes up as you um, undergo differentiation to become effectors on day seven here, and then remain closed in the memory state. And also in cluster six, these peaks are closed at the beginning. They open up as the NK cells differentiate and remain open in uh, the memory state. And we're interested in a lot of the, the genes that behave this way. Um, and, and also there are these more um, what Colleen is calling transient peaks that, um, for example, in clusters two through five, uh, start off closed, they, they open at various time points, and then they, they close again and return to their native state by the memory pool. And so she's calling these transient. Um, when she compared the chromatin accessibility to the transcriptome, she found that um, early on, you get this very similar pattern between the ATAC-seq and the RNA-seq when you go from zero to two um, and two to four and four to seven. And this interested her because when she performed um, pathway analysis, she found many of the pathways that we've been studying for a long time uh, highlighted in these um, correlated um, transcriptome to um, epigenetic state, if you will. So, so when she finds pathways that are correlated between the ATAC and the RNA, um, some of our favorite cytokine pathways popped up. So, so the more pro-inflammatory ones, such as IL-12 and type 1 interferon, and then what we think of more homeostatic cytokines like, like IL-2 or 15, also showed up in her pathway analysis. And we know that um, these cytokines will trigger downstream stats that can mediate um, various transcriptional responses. <clears throat> in their more recent study, um, Colleen and Gabby um, found that there's this window in which NK cells are programmed by these cytokines because the, the expression of these cytokines here in the various tissues they examine are somewhat transient. Um, so we know the NK cells are mediating innate and then adaptive responses, but the window in which they're exposed to type 1 interferon or IL-12 or, or 2 and 15 occur about 24 to 48 hours after um, infection. And then by 72 hours start to come back to baseline. Um, we know that the NK cells are seeing these cytokines during um, this window because you can look at their downstream phosphorylated stats. So STAT1 downstream type, inter type 1 interferon um, comes up and then starts to 
go back down at 72 hours. Similarly, phosphorylated STAT4 downstream of IL-12 and phosphostat 5 downstream of IL-2 and 15. They seem to peak at about 48 hours and then start to come back down. Um, in previous studies from our lab, we've we highlighted an important and non-redundant role for these stats. If you ablate STAT1, STAT4, or a single copy of STAT5, because if you get rid of both, you don't get NK cells, um, you cripple the ability of these knockout NK cells to respond compared to wild type. Um, and th these were from studies we previously published. Um, in Colleen and Gabby's more recent study, um, they decided to more specifically focus on these individual signals um, because we know that during an in vivo viral infection, uh, things are very complex and a lot is going on. Various you know, cytokines, in addition to the ones I've highlighted, are produced and we'll use some of these stats. Um, in addition, these cytokines I've highlighted will also use other stat members. And so in vivo, things can be very complicated. So, so what Colleen and Gabby decided to do was to deconvolute these signals, to simplify them by looking at what happens when um, you introduce only one or two or, or a combination of these signals and to look by transcriptome, um, by epigenome, um, by chromatin accessibility, and, and by looking at uh, where these transcription factors are binding and, and the histone modifications associated with that binding. And so um, because this study was published recently, I'm just going to highlight um, in cartoon format, their, their conclusions. If you're interested in the, in the heavily computational analysis that Colleen has done, um, please have a look at her paper. Um, and so the, the conclusions of her study are that during a viral infection in, in either mouse or in human, so we looked at both mouse NK cells as well as human NK cells that integrate um, these pro-inflammatory as well as homeostatic cytokine signals, um, she found that type 1 interferon, um, which induces STAT1, will um, target the promoters of genes more so than intergenic or intronic regions. STAT4 and 5, on the other hand, will, will um, more, will, will, will target um, the intergenic and intronic regions uh, more so than the promoters, but um, what, what STAT1 does is it, it impacts the, the histone modifications found um, where it binds, whereas STAT4 and STAT5, its impact is more in inducing changes in chromatin accessibility. So these mediate very distinct modes of epigenetic modification, um, either histone regulation or, or chromatin uh, accessibility. What she also found was that STAT4 and STAT5 have a more synergistic relationship and the genes are shared in which um, these cytokines induce. And at the same time, STAT4 will antagonize uh, the STAT1 induced genes. So there is an antagonistic relationship between these stats and their upstream signals. And then the, the summary of, of these signals is that you get a negative feedback uh, loop such that as soon as you um, activate these very potent um, effector cells and killer cells, you probably want to start shutting off these effector programs. And so th this is just a cartoon summary of, of their findings. And um, again, if you're interested, uh, please have a look at their paper. Um, so going forward, I wanted to give um, Colleen and also another postdoc in the lab, Adriana, a chance to share some unpublished findings from our lab. And I, I think they're very exciting studies. So Colleen, as I mentioned, will be starting her own lab um, at Cornell this summer. Um, and Adriana is a postdoc who more recently joined my lab from UCSF, and she's got a very interesting um, study as well. So we're gonna play a little bit of musical chairs in the next few minutes, and I'm gonna have um, 
them jump in and present their work so that um, you guys can get to know them a little bit. Okay, hi everyone. Um, first and foremost, thanks to Joe and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to tag team on this platform and talk about some of the recent work I've been working on. Um, so uh, what I'd like to talk about is uh, essentially an expansion of some of the things that Joe was talking about in terms of how we're trying to understand the epigenetic landscape of memory and K cells. Um, and so, you know, we had uh, shown before that um, NK cells undergo a very dynamic changes in chromatin accessibility over time. Um, but while chromatin accessibility is, you know, a very um, a general reflection of a lot of these epigenetic cues, um, you know, there are certainly uh, other types of epigenetic uh, regulation that can occur at different orders at different levels. Um, and so at, you know, high order level, you know, how chromosomes may be positioned in the nucleus or um, at a 3D chromatin level. Um, but for this talk, I'd like to focus on a very oversimplified view of the 2D genome. Um, and so, you know, when we think of chromosome component accessibility, when we look at chromatin accessibility, um, we see that, you know, they're going to be very punctate signals um, flanked by blank spaces. Um, and what we want to explore um, and understand better is what's happening at those blank spaces. Um, so, of course, uh, one thing that we know that occurs um, in those spaces is um, uh, dynamic regulation of DNA methylation. Um, and so, um, you know, the, this talk will be talking about um, how uh, we can understand the relationship between chromatin accessibility and DNA methylation in our NK cells throughout the course of viral infection. Um, so going back to this very oversimplified view of the TD genomic landscape, you know, generally when we think of accessibility, we think of um, it being permissive. You know, it's open to transcription factors and all two um, to promote transcription. Um, and so, you know, in, in doing so, the, it's, it's, you know, it's open, it's more permissive. Um, on the other hand, you think of DNA methylation and soft associated with repression. Um, but, you know, recent evidence has really, you know, um, shown that while this is a very common occurrence, and that accessibility is often associated with permissive uh, a permissive landscape and DNA methylation with a non-permissive landscape, you know, this certainly isn't dogma. Um, there are many cases where there are epigenetic uh, or methylation marks, uh, depending on the type of methylation that may be indicative of a more permissive landscape. Um, and on the flip side, there are certainly regions that are open to transcription factors or other factors that are um, actually have a negative impact on transcription. Um, and so, you know, the, the opposite can occur. And then on top of that, you know, you can add further complexity and ask, you know, what happens when both of them are in the same area? Um, is it permissive? Is it non-permissive? And, you know, it seems that it really does seem to be context dependent. Um, and so what we wanted to know um, is how, what this interplay of DNA methylation accessibility is um, and how we can use this information to really help guide us on how, what the, the factors are that rewire a, a memory NK cell. And so what we did was uh, perform whole genome by sulfite se sequencing um, on um, NK cells throughout uh, viral infection, very similar to what uh, Joe had described before when we looked at, um, when we performed a tax seek on, um, to look at chromatin accessibility. Um, and so, you know, first things that we would wanna ask is, um, you know, how does methylation change over time? Um, and so what I'm showing you here is a, a PCA of the methylation profiles of our NK cells um, throughout infection, and they're color-coded the same way as it was before, and I've labeled them for you. Um, and you can see that, unlike what we see with chromatin accessibility, um, a majority of the changes actually start to occur at day four as opposed to day two. Um, and I do want to note that around, you know, the, this x-axis axis is uh, PC1, which incorporates, um, which explains most of the variance um, uh, in, in this PCA analysis. And you can see it's 90%. So, you know, if any, any change that acro changes across the x-axis is, is quite significant. Um, and so from day zero to two to four, there are significant changes 
Um, and then from four to seven, there's even more changes. But by the time you get to seven, 14, and 35, things to be seem to be relatively stable. Um, you know, another thing that we can ask is uh, of these regions that are changing, um, where are they changing relative to the gene? And what we find interestingly is that a lot of these DMRs um, are actually located within these non-promoter and intergenic regions. You know, unlike more traditional view of uh, thinking of DNA methylation in these promoter regions. Um, and so these intergenic and trionic regions, and in some cases exonic, could uh, represent putative enhancer regions. Um, and of course, we can next ask, you know, in what direction is the methylation changing? Um, and so what I'm showing you here is the proportion of a methylation over time. And what I've done is just separate the, um, the profiles into different clusters. And so you can see that clusters one through five pretty much show a very similar pattern. Um, and so they have different baselines, but for the most part, what happens is there, there starts to be a decrease at day four and a further decrease at day seven, and it's pretty much maintained throughout um, until the memory time point at day 35. Now, the exception is this cluster six, where there are a few regions that actually become hypermethylated. Um, so for example, uh, if we look at our favorite gene, the interferon gamma locus, um, we can see that not surprisingly, it becomes demethylated. Um, and, you know, this has been and described before with NK cells as well as T cells. Um, but you can see that, you know, NK cells actually start out with this intronic promoter region as uh, with a very um, uh, hypomethylated, generally hypomethylated area. But uh, upon viral infection, upon memory formation, you can see that it, it becomes completely demethylated, which I, I find pretty remarkable. Um, and so this is just a region that's highlighted a little bit more. It's the same thing, just shown as a bar plot. Um, and likewise, we can look at another locus, SAT4, which is an important upstream regulator in ferron gamma. Um, and we can look at this uh, intronic region that also shows the same kind of profile, so uh, a demethylation um, at this region. And so now that we have kind of this idea of, you know, how the methylation is regulated, we can now start to explore, you know, how the methylation is uh, affecting accessibility or vice versa. And so one thing that we can do um, is to look at the relationship between um, uh, where the DMRs are uh, relative to the DARs, or the differentially accessible regions are, um, and ask, you know, does this matter? Um, so what I did was I took the differentially methylated regions and I found the most proximal differentially accessible, well, uh, the most proximal accessible region um, regardless of their DA and, uh, status, um, and just uh, calculate the distance between the two, and then plotted these distances across all the DMRs. Um, and so if you look at this distribution, what we actually find is that there seems to be kind of two populations, um, and that this distribution kind of has this, you know, bimodal um, um, shape right here. And so if we cut it where it, it, the bimodal um, uh, distribution splits, we find that this um, the split actually occurs around 384 base pairs. Um, and so this width is actually smaller than what you would see with an average DMR and smaller than what you see with an average uh, accessible region. Um, and so pretty much anything smaller than this, uh, it seems like it would be an overlap between the DMRs and the DARs or the DMRs and the, um, the accessible regions. Um, and so what I did was uh, essentially take our DMRs and categorize them as either proximal um, or distal. Um, and so we can ask uh, across these two, um, these two different uh, categories, what the relationship is with differential accessibility. Um, and so among the proximal DMRs or among the distal DMRs, what's the representation of regions that are also differentially accessible, that have some sort of change in, in, in accessibility at some point during infection? And we find that it is these proximal regions that have a higher proportion of these DARs than the distal ones. Um, and so this is uh, represented here with this. So this is the, the actual numbers here as shown as a bar plot. Um, and then shown here is that the proportion. Well, um, you know, there's a slight increase. It is significant, um, but you know, it, it, it changes, but not 
uh, terribly by much. Um, and there is still a significant amount of um, data R is found with the distal regions. Now you can argue that, you know, my cutoff is actually quite small. And so, you know, what 500 base pairs could still be um, uh, proximal. But uh, I have done analyses uh, extending this cutoff. And if you go higher and higher, this number, this proportion does get smaller in the distal um, regions, but there's still a significant proportion um, of DARs within these distal regions. Um, and so while proximal DMRs are associated with DARs, um, you know, it's not a, a, a strict rule. Um, but, you know, the, these proximal regions, there's clearly something interesting that's going on. Um, and so if we now focus on these regions, um, we can now kind of track how uh, these uh, changes in accessibility happen over time and see how those changes may relate to the changes in, in, um, in methylation. And what we find is that it's rather variable and that the changes aren't completely in sync with what we see with methylation. Um, and so what we see, for example, in this cluster one is that, um, you know, there's a kind of a burst of accessibility um, at day two um, and after that burst, there's a, then you start seeing the, demethylate, the um, regions being demethylated at uh, day four, um, which is maintained over time. Um, and in terms of accessibility, it kind of tapers off and remains, you know, subtly uh, differentially accessible um, in the memory. Now, this is in contrast to what you see with cluster two, um, where, you know, it looks like methylation is taking a little bit of the lead. Um, so accessibility doesn't change at day four, but methylation does change at day four. Um, and um, after that occurs, then there's this increase in accessibility. Uh, and then cluster three is kind of a combination of the two where you do start to see this increase in accessibility at day two. Um, and it, it continues to rise, which coincides with a decrease in methylation um, and both the increase in accessibility and a decrease or uh, methylation is maintained over time. Um, now, ultimately, you know, we kind of want to know how all of these changes end up rewiring a memory NK cell. And so to look at that, we um, can also now focus on what I uh, defined previously and what Joe had mentioned um, um, as stable peaks. So these are peaks that are significantly different in memory versus naive. And you can um, see that there is a significant representation of these stable regions among these DMRs, these proximal DMRs. Um, there are actually more in this cluster three um, than the, the rest of them. Um, and what we think it is happening is that, you know, these different clusters might be um, working in different ways to rewire the NK cell. Um, and in terms of, you know, what's a, what's a pioneer factor versus what's being recruited. Um, and so there's very interesting biology that might be re um, uh, revealed looking at these, uh, from looking at these different patterns. And that's something we're, are, we're still uh, trying to explore. Um, now, in addition to, you know, stable rewiring by chromatin accessibility, we can, um, of course, ultimately look at how it changes permissiveness. Uh, and to look at that, we would look at transcription. Um, and so at these same proximal DMRs, um, I'm looking at the uh, relative changes in transcription shown on um, the x-axis, so comparing memory to naive, um, to the changes in um, chromatin accessibility. And again, these are all um, re genes slash regions that are associated with these proximal DMRs. Um, and what we see is that the effect on this permissiveness or this, this uh, um, transcription is kind of variable. And so in cluster three, as I mentioned, you know, the, what I showed before, which is the one that um, had that, you know, blip of accessibility at day two, and then it slowly increased. Um, this one seems to have somewhat of a correlation with uh, transcription. You know, you get increased um, accessibility and you get um, an increase in, in transcription that's associated with this decrease in methylation. But when you look at um, cluster two, it's not so much, or at least it's a little bit weaker and these might be representing a more poised state. Um, and then cluster one, it seems to be kind of the opposite where, um, you know, this decrease in methylation is actually associated with also a decrease in, in transcription. 
Um, and so there's kind of a, a wide variety of, of things going on um, that also we're trying to explore. Um, now, up until now, I really just focused on looking at, you know, these proximal regions. Um, and when it comes to memory, I had showed that, you know, among these proximal regions, there is a, a significant enrichment um, of these, um, uh, these stable, uh, stably changed, um, uh, differentially accessible regions. Um, but if we step back, you know, what about the proximal or what about the distal regions? Um, it turns out there are uh, so a lot of differentially accessible regions there, um, and they uh, actually act in a different manner. Um, and so what I'm showing you here are all of the memory, the stable peaks um, associated with these DMRs. And I've categorized them by those associated with uh, proximal DMRs and those that are associated with distal DMRs. Um, and you can see that um, among the DARs that are associated with proximal DMRs, you get this increase um, in, in accessibility. Um, however, if you look at the distal ones, it's actually the opposite. You get a decrease in accessibility. Um, and so we think that there, there's certainly something different that's going on with the, um, the regions that are close to the DMRs versus the ones that are um, far from the DMRs. Um, and so just uh, to summarize, um, we uh, can show that global demethylation starts to occur in NK cells around day four, which is very um, uh, dissimilar to what we see with accessibility. Um, these DMRs are largely found in these putative enhancer regions rather than the more traditional promoter regions. Um, and um, the proximal DMRs or the overlapping DMRs are more likely to coincide with changes with um, chromatin accessibility, but not always. Um, and there are lots of changes in DNA methylation that generally lag behind chromatin accessibility, um, but there is still, you know, a, at least a substantial portion that seem to precede it. Um, and finally, the accessibility of some memory peaks um, are differentially altered um, based on the uh, DMR proximity. So ones that are close to DMRs seem to increase accessibility and those that are far uh, decrease accessibility. And so for future directions, I mean, there, there's lots of questions. It's preliminary data that's very preliminary. preliminary. Um, but you know, one main question we wanna ask is what are the enzymes that are actually causing this demethylation? You know, is this just a, a lack of maintenance methylation um, as these cells are proliferating or is there an active demethylation that's occurring? Um, you know, at these DMRs, whether they're distal or proximal, what are some of the transcription factors that may be affecting um, methylation and accessibility and ultimately transcription. Um, and, you know, based on our previous work and lots of, of um, um, work before, um, you know, how does this compare to T cells? We've already shown that there are a lot of parallels between NK cells and T cells. Um, does it also apply to DNA methylation? Uh, and finally, um, you know, what are the role of cytokines in regulating methylation? Um, especially pro-inflammatory cytokines, which have uh, been shown uh, by multiple people that, you know, they could have some long lasting um, qualities to them. Um, and is that mediated by methylation? Um, uh, and so with that, um, you know, looking at the role of cytokines is, a, is an active um, field investigation um, in what I, in, in what will be my lab. <laughs> Um, and, you know, if you're interested in any of it, um, please reach out. With that, I'll hand off to um, Adriana and thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah. First off, uh, thanks to Joe and Colleen, as well as the organizers. Um, complimentary to what's been shown already, um, we're con we continue to explore mechanisms by which uh, adaptive NK cells are optimally generated. Um, and we've recently become quite interested in um, exploring whether there could be differences in um, tissue microenvironments that may lead to differential um, antiviral NK cell responses. Uh, so to begin, we actually revisited Joe's original data um, in which he observed that at the peak of um, adaptive or Li49H positive NK cell expansion uh, following MCMB at day seven. Um, 
there's actually it, there actually seems to be pretty uniform distribution of these adaptive NK cells uh, across NK excuse me across MCMB uh, infected sites such as the spleen, liver, lung, or kidney, um, with the exception of uninvolved lymph nodes. Um, this is really in line with the traditional view of NK cell function um, as innate um, cells, uh, and that they can readily respond to a broad set of pro-inflammatory uh, stimuli. Uh, and this poises them so that they can, um, as they uh, circulate systemically, um, allows them to respond um, rapidly um, and with ease across different sites uh, should they need to be activated. Um, however, we were interested in um, better resolving how this kinetic of adaptive NK cell expansion um, evolves and occurs. Um, and so here we actually tracked um, the antigen specific Li49H NK cell response uh, following early time points of MCMB. Um, and so you can appreciate in the spleen that uh, the peak of expansion remains day seven, um, but the NK cells actually seem to undergo a rapid burst of um, expansion or proliferation um, between a tight time window of day four to day five. Um, what really surprised us, however, um, was that this uh, burst seemed to be accelerated in the spleen um, in comparison to other uh, sites such as the blood, liver, or peritoneal cavity, uh, which are known to be early sites of MCMV infection. Um, although we have observed that uh, there, are, do, there does seem to be higher viral burden um, at some of these peripheral sites compared to the spleen, um, right now, we don't actually think that um, these differences in viral titers um, are what's impairing um, the adaptive expansion in, in the, these tissues, um, because when we treated mice with the antiviral um, agent uh, gancitflavir, um, we weren't able to actually rescue that diminished uh, expansion in the liver, peritoneal cavity, or blood. Um, instead, uh, we decide to explore the um, hypothesis that perhaps the spleen might be um, providing a favorable or unique environment uh, for the early priming of adaptive NK cell responses. Um, and so to address this, we did a few experiments. Um, here, uh, we sorted Li49H uh, MCMV specific NK cells um, from the spleen or liver uh, of early infected um, B6 mice and retransferred them into infection matched Live 49H knockout mice, um, which again allows us to track the antigen specific response. Um, as you can see, uh, NK cells that actually were primed in the spleen far out competed those that have been primed in other sites, such as the liver. Um, and we don't think that this is due to differences in, let's say, homing um, preferences or even um, requirements for different um, tissue, you know, specific sites. Um, because we found this um, heavy skew um, to be present not just in the spleen, um, but other peripheral sites that we assayed, uh, including the liver here as an example. Uh, this made us wonder whether the spleen, again, um, was contributing a unique priming um, environment um, to the systemic um, adaptive response. Uh, and so, indeed, when we splenectomized um, mice and look to see um, the role of the spleen um, in general for priming adaptive NK cell responses. Um, we observed a reduction in adaptive NK cell responses um, across the different organs. Again, arguing that the spleen um, is a critical site for early priming um, during MCMB. Um, and so together, these data made us want to um, explore further what and ask um, what about the spleen might be providing such a favorable niche. Um, and to look into this further, um, we compared the transcriptional programming of NK cells that were being primed in the spleen as compared to other sites like the liver. Um, and so here we looked at um, genes that were differentially expressed upon priming in the spleen um, day two as opposed to uninfected mice um, and compared those uh, genes to those that were differentially expressed in the liver. Um, and you can see that the vast majority of genes that are being um, induced or repressed um, with NK cell activation um, are largely similar between different sites of infection, um, which is supported by the fact that um, with MCMB being a systemic uh, viral infection, um, we think of the NK cells as being exposed systemically uh, to a broad set of pro-inflammatory cytokines, 
Um, and so this does in fact reflect um, similar programming across the host. Um, however, we did note um, a few select genes that seem to be selectively upregulated in the spleen as compared to the liver. Um, and these being key immune signaling components um, and specifically a few um, related to NF-kappa B signaling, um, it jogged our memory um, of the TNF pathway um, because actually in Colleen's earlier um, chromatin and transcriptional analysis of NK cells are activated post MCNV here in the spleen. Um, she noted that the TNF pathway um, was one that was a key pathway that was upregulated um, with infection. Um, and genes associated with this include uh, various subunits of NF kappa B, um, as well as the receptor for TNF, um, or here TNFR2. Uh, and indeed, TNFR2 is actually basally expressed by um, resting NK cells, uh, and then is further upregulated upon um, activation here at day two, um, following MCMB. Um, and this upregulation um, occurs both at the transcriptional level as well as protein level, uh, and appears to be at least partially STAT4 dependent, um, which is likely due to IL-12 signaling. Uh, in conjunction with this upregulation um, of TNFR2 on NK cells, um, we also noted that um, this coincides with an upregulation of TNF alpha production um, by a number of myeloid populations, including macrophages and VCs um, here in the spleen, um, as well as granulocytes sites such as neutrophils. Um, and so together, this coordinated um, induction of TNF uh, signaling. Um, led us to ask whether uh, TNFR2 is uh, critical for the regulation of uh, NK antiviral functionality and responses. Um, and so to get at this, we made uh, mixed bone marrow chimeras with wild type and TNFR2 um, knockout cells um, and looked at how um, the uh, TNFR2 deficient NK cells um, behave following MCMB infection. And so at early time points, um, NK cells that lack TNFR2 um, did exhibit reduced um, activation um, and also had defects in their ability to produce interferon gamma. Uh, given the importance of interferon gamma as um, an antiviral effector molecule, um, we we're especially interested in the role of TNF in driving um, this production. Um, and we were actually able to recapitulate um, the importance or sufficiency of uh, TNF-alpha in driving um, optimal gamma production by NK cells um, here ex vivo, um, where we found that although IL-12 or TNF alone um, did not induce interferon gamma production, uh, the combination of those two cytokines ex vivo um, did in fact, again, reflecting um, the um, activation settings during MCMB. Importantly, um, this induction of um, interferon gamma was dependent um, on TNFR2, uh, but not TNFR1. Uh, TNFR2 is known to signal through a number of um, different signaling arms uh, downstream, including PI3 kinase, MAPK signaling, uh, as well as canonical and non-canonical NF-kappa B. And so using small molecule inhibitors, um, we we're able to determine that the TNF-induced um, gamma, um, while a number of these uh, signaling nodes are dispensable for that gamma, um, P38, as well as canonical NF-kappa B, um, does appear to be critical in mediating that TNF-induced um, interferon gamma production. In addition to these um, innate functions, um, getting back to the adaptive cell response, um, again, um, we're finding that TNFR2 does appear to be a critical player um, in driving optimal NK cell expansion. Um, so by at early time points, we um, do start to see that TNFR2 deficient NK cells um, exhibit some reduction in their ability to proliferate, um, but it's really between the day four and day five time point um, when the NK cells, adaptive NK cells specifically, are undergoing that robust clonal burst of proliferation in the spleen, um, where we see a profound defect um, by these TNFR2 knockout NK cells, where they're really incapable of expanding to the same extent. 
we turn to RNA seq to understand a bit better um, as to what could be underlying um, this failure to expand. And so while there were not actually that many genes that were differentially um, expressed between wild type and knockout cells at early time points post MCMV, um, TNFR2 knockout NK cells um, really exhibited uh, transcriptional dysfunction at that day four time point, right, um, as they're going to um, divide. Um, and when we did pathway analysis, uh, we found that wild type uh, NK cells uh, exhibited higher levels of um, genes transcriptionally that were associated with um, cell cycle, DNA replication, and cell division, um, as well as non-canonical NF-kappa B signaling. And so diving into that a little bit um, with more granularity, um, we can appreciate that, yes, indeed, um, TNF are deficient, are two deficient NK cells um, are not able to upregulate um, a number of genes associated with cell cycle um, at this day four time point to the same extent um, as their wild type counterparts. Um, and this seems to result in um, an inability to undergo cell division to the same magnitude. Uh, curiously, uh, these TNFR2 knockout NK cells um, also do not seem to repress um, interference signaling as well as NK cell receptor signaling um, as they should. Um, and so here you can appreciate that um, the knockout cells still retain higher levels of inhibitory uh, molecules like CD69 and CD38. Um, and then lastly, um, we noted that the knockout cells also fail to sustain um, expression, high expression um, of NF-kappa B related uh, genes, including notably um, those related to non-canonical NF-kappa B signaling. Um, this caught our eye, especially because um, non-canonical NF-kappa B is known to be um, such a distinct um, arm engaged with TNF family receptor um, uh, members in general. Um, and in support of this, um, when we assayed whether um, NIK or not, which is the kinase upstream that induces non-canonical NF-kappa B signaling um, was required or not, we found that NK cells that lacked um, non-canonical NF-kappa B signaling um, similarly failed to expand um, following MCMB um, with diminished adaptive NK cell responses. Um, and so together, uh, this data, we're putting together a working model um, in which we think that the spleen is providing a unique and favorable niche um, for the priming of effective adaptive NK cell responses. Um, and that this is at least in part um, mediated strongly through TNFR2 signaling. Um, we're observing that TNFR2, which has not uh, been characterized um, in NK cell function previously, um, seems to be facilitating innate to adaptive this innate to adaptive transition um, in driving proliferation um, and allowing for optimal um, NK cell responses. This seems to be uh, mediated through um, the maintenance of NK cell activation uh, programs via both canonical and non-canonical NF-kappa B signaling, um, while in conjunction with the repression of um, various activating immune programs um, during this transition time. Uh, and so with that, I'll let Joe come back to cap it all off. Um, and thank you again. All right. Thanks, Colleen and Adriana for um, presenting your work. You guys are awesome. Um, but this acknowledgement slide already highlights um, Colleen and Adriana who presented their work and other members of the lab who contributed. Um, uh, Colleen's earlier studies were done in collaboration with John O'Shea's group. Um, we um, jointly submitted papers together. Um, Kathy Shu helped us with the human work in those studies. Christina Leslie is a computational biologist here at Sloan Kettering who helped with a lot of the platforms that Colleen has used and, and always rigorously assesses our work. Uh, ben Youngblood helped us with the uh, whole genome bisulfite sequencing. Um, and Louis Lanier and Sasha Rudansky are always um, helpful with feedback and, and very uh, 
<clears throat> constructive criticism for the most part. <laughs> and uh, these are the folks that have funded us. Um, thanks again, Laura and the Immuno Talks uh, Committee for this opportunity to present our work. Thank you so much, Joe and Colleen and Adriana. It was so wonderful to have the three of you. Um, such beautiful and inspirational work. I'm sure there are so many questions. So um, what I'll do now is I'll share um, my screen. Um, just to let everybody know um, how they can do that. So um, the Q&A will be by Twitter. If you search for the account Global Immunotalks and then find the tweet that says, ask questions here for Dr. Joseph Sun, um, you can reply to that tweet with your question mentioning the hashtag Global Immuno and um, Joe or maybe Adriana and Colleen as well. It's a shared lab account and we'll be able to answer your questions either in real time um, after the um, seminar today or um, in, I'm sure, um, for some time afterwards, um, Joe's kindly agreed um, to answer your questions. Um, so um, also it leads me to remind you that next week, um, tune in, we'll have a pre-recorded talk from, um, due to the time difference of um, Kazuo Morrow, and the title will be Discovery of Group 2 Innate Lymphoid Cells, and again, that just leaves me to thank Joe once more. It was such a pleasure to see you, to listen to your wonderful, wonderful work. I'm sure you're inspiration to so many. Thank you so much again. And that just leaves me um, to close this session of Global Immuno Talks. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Take care. Take care. <laughs>